Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. That's right, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for October 30th through November 5th, 2023. This is covering Hebrews chapters 1 through 6. And now, let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Hey, Scriptures! So nice to have you. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 15 minutes, 34 seconds. Oh, wow, so short. And what would it be daily? 2 minutes, 13 seconds. Oh, we've got so much extra time to study and take a closer look at what we're reading. Here we've got time codes if you want to take it chapter by chapter. Otherwise, buckle up and we'll talk about them all together. Let's take our introduction to the book of Hebrews from the 2016 Seminary Manual. It says, We do not know where Paul's letter to the Hebrews was written. We also do not know exactly when it was written. However, most assume that it was written around A.D. 60 to 62, near the same time as Paul's letters to the Philippians, the Colossians, the Ephesians, and Philemon. Most Latter-day Saints accept Paul as the author of Hebrews. However, there are some who question whether Paul wrote this epistle because its style and language are different from Paul's other letters. It is generally agreed that even if the pen was not Paul's, the ideas were because the doctrines in Hebrews agree with those found in Paul's other letters. The prophet Joseph Smith attributed statements from Hebrews to the Apostle Paul. For the purposes of this manual... We accept Paul as the author. Paul wrote the epistle to the Hebrews to encourage Jewish members of the church to maintain their faith in Jesus Christ and not to return to their former ways. Under the pressure of various afflictions, many of these Jewish Christians were apparently withdrawing from the church and returning to the relative safety of Jewish worship at the synagogue. Paul desired to show these Jewish Christians that the law of Moses itself pointed to Jesus Christ and his atonement as the true source of salvation. So remember what we said earlier this year, that Paul's epistles were arranged according to length. The longest epistles, including Romans and 1 Corinthians, were in the front, and the shorter epistles, like Titus and Philemon, were at the end. Hebrews is certainly longer than Titus and Philemon, but it's placed here because even among some in early Christianity, it wasn't clear whether or not Paul actually wrote this epistle. It's not even clear that it's an epistle. It doesn't have the usual greetings, nor does it declare who is writing like the other epistles do. This has led some scholars to suggest that it's a sermon or homily, not an epistle. Of course, it could mean that we might be missing part of it. It certainly has an ending in the same style as other epistles. But for our purposes, we're going to say that it is an epistle and that it was written by Paul. And so, let's get started in Hebrews chapter 1. Let's look at some verses of Paul's teachings on the subject of Jesus Christ. Let's start in verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, or check the footnote, in many locations and various ways, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And then let's skip to verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Wow. You know, what might be a great activity when you're studying with your family is to have the kids go through and see how many truths about Jesus Christ they can pull out from these verses. Let's take a look at some of them here. Jesus Christ created the heavens and the earth, like it says in verses 2 and 10. Also, Jesus Christ speaks for the Father, as it says in verse 2. Or again in verse 2, Jesus Christ is the heir of the Father. Jesus Christ is in the express image of the Father, like in verse 3. 
Also, Jesus Christ upholds all things by the word of his power. Again, verse 3. And again in verse 3, purges our sins. And again, reigns at the right hand of the Father. So remember we talked about in the introduction that Paul seems to be addressing those that have fallen back into their old patterns of Jewish worship. Which of these truths about Jesus Christ might be helpful if we are tempted to turn away from doing the Lord's will? The Come, Follow Me and Institute manual include this great quote from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. This comes from the October 2003 General Conference, a talk called The Grandeur of God. He says, quote, Jesus came to improve man's view of God and to plead with them to love their Heavenly Father as he has always and will always love them. So feeding the hungry, healing the sick, rebuking hypocrisy, pleading for faith, this was Christ showing us the way of the Father, end quote. That's an incredible statement. Jesus came to improve man's view of God. Wow. Now, remember that one theme in the book of Hebrews is the superiority of Jesus Christ. For example, in chapter 1, verses 4 through 14, Paul showed that Jesus Christ is greater than the angels. In subsequent chapters, he continued to show the excellency and superiority of Christ. Keep looking for this theme as we continue studying Hebrews. And that brings us to Hebrews chapter 2. What other characteristics of Jesus do we see? Let's start in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Let's skip to verse 13. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. The word translated as tempted could also be translated as tried or subject to trial. The word succor means to run to the aid of someone. Excellent. What an amazing lesson about Jesus Christ in those verses. Did you notice in verse 17 that Paul likened Jesus Christ to a Jewish high priest because the high priest was viewed as a mediator between the people and God. Also in verses 14 through 18, Paul explains why Jesus Christ is able to understand us perfectly and sympathize with all our frailties and imperfections. Because he suffered and was tempted in all things, he understands us perfectly and can help us in times of need. Paul reemphasizes this in chapter 4, starting in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, that's so beautiful. Note that coming boldly under the throne of grace does not mean that we come arrogantly or by our own terms. We come boldly because of our confidence in the grace Christ provides and his power to change and heal us. From the April 2012 General Conference, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland says, quote, Surely the thing God enjoys most about being God 
is the thrill of being merciful, especially to those who don't expect it and often feel they don't deserve it. Close quote. The seminary manual also includes this quote from the April 2014 General Conference. This comes from Elder David A. Bednar. He says, quote, There is no physical pain, no spiritual wound, no anguish of soul or heartache, no infirmity or weakness you or I ever confront in mortality that the Savior did not experience first. In a moment of weakness, we may cry out, No one knows what it is like. No one understands. But the Son of God perfectly knows and understands, for He has felt and borne our individual burdens. And because of His infinite and eternal sacrifice, He has perfect empathy and can extend to us His arm of mercy. He can reach out, touch, succor, heal, and strengthen us to be more than we could ever be and help us to do that which we could never do, relying only upon our own power, end quote. Oh, I love it. Love it. Well, that brings us to Hebrews chapter 3. In verses 1 through 6, Paul makes the case that Jesus Christ is greater than Moses. The Institute Manual offers this commentary. For the Jews... Moses was the most highly revered prophet, the one who received God's law at Sinai. The Jewish Christians being addressed in Hebrews were contemplating abandoning their faith in Christ and returning to Judaism in an attempt to remain loyal to the law of Moses. They did not understand or believe deeply enough that Christ was preeminent to Moses, having shown in Hebrews 1 and 2 that Jesus Christ is greater than the angels. Paul next explained that as the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus is greater than Moses. In verse 9, Paul then reminds his readers that anciently, after being freed from Egypt, the people of ancient Israel rebelled and provoked the Lord to anger. As it says in verse 11, So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Doctrine and Covenants 8424 teaches us that God's rest is the fullness of his glory. So, how does Paul teach us that we can enter the rest of the Lord? Let's take a look in verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Let's jump down to verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said... Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. And jumping to verse 18, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And that brings us to Hebrews chapter 4. Let's start in verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And for verse 3, we're going to add the Joseph Smith translation. It reads, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, As I have sworn in my wrath, if they harden their hearts, they shall not enter into my rest. Also, I have sworn, if they will not harden their hearts, they shall enter into my rest although the works were prepared or finished from the foundation of the world. And let's skip to verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief, again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Skipping to verse 11, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So although taught with many verses, the message is simple. 
If we remain faithful to the Savior and harden not our hearts, we will enter into the rest of the Lord. So maybe people departed from God in ancient times, but do we need to worry about that today? Elder Neil L. Anderson offers a sobering thought from his October 2020 General Conference address. He says, quote, In some parts of the world where his name has been proclaimed for centuries, faith in Jesus Christ is diminishing. The valiant saints in Europe have seen belief decline in their countries through the decades. Sadly, here in the United States, faith is also receding. A recent study revealed that in the last 10 years, 30 million people in the United States have stepped away from believing in the divinity of Jesus Christ. Looking worldwide, another study predicts that in the decades ahead, more than twice as many will leave Christianity as will embrace it. Close quote. But remember that faith is our choice. The seminary manual includes this quote from President Russell M. Nelson. This comes from the April 2021 General Conference. Quote, Choose to believe in Jesus Christ. If you have doubts about God the Father and His beloved Son, or the validity of the restoration, or the veracity of Joseph Smith's divine calling as a prophet, choose to believe and stay faithful. Take your questions to the Lord and to other faithful sources. Study with the desire to believe rather than with the hope that you can find a flaw in the fabric of a prophet's life or a discrepancy in the scriptures. Stop increasing your doubts by rehearsing them with other doubters. Allow the Lord to lead you on your journey of spiritual discovery. End quote. Wonderful. And that brings us to Hebrews chapter 5. As we already read, Paul described the Savior as a great high priest. Look for what Paul taught about the role of the high priest among the Israelites. Starting in verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins." The office of high priest referred to in these verses was, under the law of Moses, the presiding office in the Aaronic priesthood. Aaron, Moses' brother, was the first high priest of the Aaronic order. The office was hereditary. After the time of Aaron, the high priest was selected from among the firstborn descendants of Aaron and his sons. The high priest usually served for the remainder of his life, but this office was eventually seized by wicked men. As the Bible Dictionary says in the entry for high priest, quote, High priests were inappropriately appointed and deposed at pleasure by Herod and the Romans alike. The office was filled by 28 different men between 37 B.C. and A.D. 68, close quote. Wow. Going on, verse 4. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. This is how a high priest is supposed to be called. Exodus 28.1, this is God speaking on Mount Sinai. He says, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. So, those who are ordained to the priesthood must be called of God by revelation through his authorized servants. In the church today, authorized priesthood leaders are to interview each candidate for ordination and seek the guidance of the Holy Ghost to determine a candidate's readiness and worthiness to be ordained to the priesthood. Remember what we studied earlier this year, that Jesus taught the twelve apostles in John chapter 15, verse 16, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. Both the Old and New Testaments record that prophets, priesthood holders, and gospel teachers receive their calling by the laying on of hands by an authorized priesthood holder. Let's go on in verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, 
Today have I begotten thee. Now he's quoting Psalm 2, verse 7 there. Going on, verse 6. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And there he's quoting Psalm 110, verse 4. Going on with verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Again, Paul refers to Melchizedek, a prophet and king who lived during the time of Abraham. However, because Melchizedek was a type of Christ, these verses also relate to the Savior. And look what Jesus became in verse 9, perfect and the author of salvation to all who will come to him. In the April 1999 General Conference, President James E. Faust said, quote, As in all things, the Savior is our pattern. The Apostle Paul wrote, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. In our own finite way, we too can learn obedience even as Christ did. When obedience becomes our goal, it is no longer an irritation. Instead of a stumbling block, it becomes a building block. Close quote. I love that. But how interesting that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered, as it mentions in verse 8. The Institute Manual has this quote from President Harold B. Lee. This comes from the manual, Teachings of Presidents of the Church, Harold B. Lee. He says, quote, There is a refining process that comes through suffering, I think, that we can't experience any other way than by suffering. We draw closer to him who gave his life that man might be. We feel a kinship that we have never felt before. He suffered more than we can ever imagine. But to the extent that we have suffered, somehow it seems to have the effect of drawing us closer to the divine, helps to purify our souls, and helps to purge out the things that are not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. End quote. President Lee further taught that suffering has a necessary purpose. Quote, A young mother went through the trying experience of having a little child who was killed in an accident, and she came and sought a blessing for comfort. She asked through her tears, Must there always be pain in this life? I thought a few minutes and then said, The Apostle Paul said of the Master, the Lord and Savior, Though he were a son... Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered? I suppose the answer is yes. There must always be pain in this life of travail and sorrow, and there is a purpose in it all. End quote. That comes from the April 1964 General Conference. That's a powerful doctrine, and difficult but also comforting to those who understand it. In verses 11 through 14 of chapter 5, Paul expressed a desire to teach more on this subject, but said the people lacked the spiritual understanding and maturity to understand more advanced teachings. And that brings us to Hebrews chapter 6. Let's start in verse 1, and we'll include a couple of Joseph Smith translation inserts. Verse 1, Therefore, not leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment, and we will go on unto perfection, if God permit. The Institute Manual tells us this Joseph Smith translation change in verse 1 supports the original Greek text of the phrase, which translates as having left behind the beginning of the doctrine. The saints addressed in Hebrews had already received the first principles, ordinances, and doctrines of the gospel, including faith, repentance, baptism, and the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were not to abandon those principles, but were to continue growing towards spiritual maturity from that beginning point. The phrase in verse 1, go on unto perfection, 
sounds like a daunting task, but remember that perfection refers to the state of being, quote, complete, whole, or fully developed. True followers of Christ may become perfect through His grace and atonement, close quote. And here we're quoting the perfect entry in the Guide to the Scriptures. Now, in verses 4 through 8, Paul described those who are sons of perdition, who have a perfect knowledge of God and then turn away from this truth, rebel against the Savior, and refuse to repent. Paul contrasted these individuals with the faithful saints that he was addressing in this epistle. Let's start in verse 9. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Remember our studies last year and how Abraham was an example of diligence, faith, and patience in seeking God's promised blessings. Through diligence to the end, faith in Jesus Christ, and patience, we can inherit the blessings God has promised, just like Abraham. You may want to consider what it is about those traits that would help us go on to perfection, as it talks about in verse 1. Let's keep going in verse 16. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable or unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Now here he's talking about the veil of the temple, and inside that veil was the Holy of Holies, representing the presence of God. Going on in verse 20, Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Institute Manual adds, In the same way, Jesus, the great high priest, entered through the veil into heaven, to prepare the way for us to return to heaven. Our hope in Christ is an anchor to our souls. I love that phrase. As used in the scriptures, hope means, quote, the confident expectation of and longing for the promised blessings of righteousness, close quote. This is quoted from the hope entry in your guide to the scriptures. Have you felt that stability when facing challenges? That sure and steadfast anchor to our soul when all around us seems unstable and unsure? The Institute Manual includes this quote from the October 2008 General Conference. This is President Dieter F. Uchtdorf. He says, quote, Hope is a gift of the Spirit. It is a hope that through the atonement of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection— we shall be raised unto life eternal, and this because of our faith in the Savior. This kind of hope is both a principle of promise as well as a commandment. And, as with all commandments, we have the responsibility to make it an active part of our lives and overcome the temptation to lose hope. Hope in our Heavenly Father's merciful plan of happiness leads to peace, mercy, rejoicing, and gladness. The hope of salvation is like a protective helmet. It is the foundation of our faith and an anchor to our souls. End quote. Oh, amen to that. What powerful teaching. I love how confident, how focused Paul is 
on helping his listeners understand the superiority of Jesus Christ, that everything is pointing to him, and that he alone has the power to bring us into the presence of the Father. And what a powerful image it must have been for the Jews at that time, who had for centuries understood the role of the high priest. Right. But Paul helps them to see that Jesus is our great high priest. He is our mediator with the Father. He is here to show us the Father. Love it. But there's more to talk about in the book of Hebrews, so keep reading your scriptures, and we'll talk to you more about it in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're really big fans.